What's happening, family? It's Cat Sports again. Back for another afternoon with my people. Now, as usual, before I get started, let me give a shout out to the JBT community. It's just boxing talk. We're a group of people that just love to talk boxing. And we're always looking for others to join us. And you don't have to have a podcast. The only requirement is you just have to love to talk boxing. That's all. That's all. Miss Cash, hashtag JBT. Justin James, hashtag JBT. Showtime, the guy pass. Mike Masick. J Hardcore, hashtag JBT. Remo, hashtag Let's Talk Fashion, hashtag JBT. Welcome to another episode of Cast Sports Dark Story on. This is the Tuesday afternoon edition. How was everybody doing this Tuesday afternoon? Back for some more boxing history. Because if it's a weekday, two o'clock, it's the box story. And you know how we do it over here. Giving you all the boxing history you can handle. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the top rich hitters all time and some of the top power punchers of all time. See there on the screen, you got a switch hitter and power puncher, the marvelous one. Also, at the end of the show, as usual on Tuesdays, we will have a preview of tomorrow's hashtag Let's Talk Fashion with Remo. Okay, he's in here already. Salute, Remo. But everybody okay this Tuesday afternoon? It is Tuesday, right? Yeah. These days going by so fast, it, it, it might be Thursday. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But we're going to have some fun for these next couple of hours. I'm going to lead you right into the voice at four. Mm-hmm. That's how we do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, usually I don't, I usually just talk about former fighters, but today I'm going to include in the switch hitters some active guys like old Bud Crawford. Tyson Fury was a switch hitter, remember? Boops. Because there's not that many standout switch hitters. Throughout the history of our sport, the Justice, Willie Pep, uh, Marvin, can't think of too many. Well, I included some um, active guys in there, but the power punches are going to be all former, but former guys. Yeah. Thomas Hill, hashtag JBT, the mayor of YouTube, is in the building. And I can't stop talking about how big that is. The mayor of YouTube is a member of the JBT. That's huge. Mm-hmm. Salute, Mayor. Yeah, this is a big boxing week, too. We got uh, the Pro Box Week, remember? And um, we got a card Friday and Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Friday, we got uh, Oscar Valdez headlining. We got a female undisputed fight on the card, Sinisa Estrada. I don't have it in front of me and my memory ain't that good. I'm old, you know. I can't remember what happened five minutes ago. Well, I was on here five minutes, I think. But then Saturday, we got the big one, Tim Zoo and the Towering Inferno. Roly and Pitbull. Woo, I know we're ready for that one. Mm, mm, mm. We all got in that one. I got Roly. I think Roly going to catch him with something. Because, you know, Pitbull going to be right there. Roly is not going to have to look for him. And Pitbull is not going to have to look for Roley, so that, that could be fan-friendly. That could be very fan-friendly. I'm looking forward to that one. That might be the fight of the night. And we got another championship card, too. Who is it, Lyra? Uh, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> Lyra middleweight. Uh, I think Lyra is on that card, though. I got to check, but I believe he is. But I know it's three championship fights on there. So yeah, 
big week for boxing fans. We're going to be living large this week. Living large. Mm -hmm. But it's good to be with my people again. You know, in the JBT. That's a great community. Had our first meeting Saturday. Was a great productive meeting. Got some positions filled. We're having another one this Saturday at one. Maybe we can get a little more people. Because we did come up with the thought that you know, all the positions weren't filled that, uh, you know, I think I suggested it, that um, some of those positions could be filled by people that's not even in, that wasn't even in that week's meeting. So yeah, please come by the meeting Saturday, you know, because we're taking all ideas. The only bad idea is the one that you keep to yourself, you know, right? I'm not saying we're going to use all ideas, but that none of them are bad, not unless you don't tell us. Then it's a bad idea then, so please. Thomas Hill, you wasn't in there last Thursday. And I know you're three hours behind, but it's 10 o'clock on the West Coast. That ain't early. I talked to you on here like 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> What's up, T. Hill? I'm not picking on you, but you pick on me. Trying to get me up there on Sunday, so. <laughs> but how is everybody this Tuesday afternoon? This is Cass Sports, the box historian, coming at you. And we are going to be talking about switch hitters and power punches. I'm going to try to squeeze them all in. Because tomorrow we're going to start our decades. So I'm going to go through each decade on different days and bring you some history from the decades, some of the top fighters and fights from those of each decade and uh, some historical events that happened in those decades, all the way up to the 90s. Because I've heard it really go past uh, 2000. That's not just be 20 years from now. And then, of course, Friday, is, I'm going to cut, take a break from the decades and do our preview. Friday this week, the Eastern assassin himself, Larry Holmes. That's who we're going to be talking about Friday. Don't miss that one. Attentive Aunt McQueen in the building. The Casuals Corners, Aunt McQueen. That Aunt McQueen right there, yeah. And make sure you turn on your notifications for Casuals Corner because you might get one of them anytime, you know? And like I always say, you have not watched the fight until you watch one after watching the Casuals Corner, trust me, okay? After my first Casuals Corner, I watched the fight the next day. I was seeing all kinds of stuff. And I've been watching boxing 40 years that I had never seen before after watching that Casuals Corner, man, you know? Yeah, Aunt McQueen breaks it down. No, down, not down. He breaks it down. <laughs> yeah, I need to start about two thirty. Oh, five or ten more minutes. Give a few more of my people time to get in the building. You know, got Jay Hardcore himself in here, the creator of the JBT. What an idea he came up with when he came up with that one, Jay Hardcore. You all did yourself with that JBT idea, man. Mm, mm, mm. That thing is taking off too. Yes, it is. Jay always says he can't wait till three years. I'm talking about I can't wait till the end of this year to see how it is, man. Mm -hmm. That thing is really taking off. And I'm proud to be a part of it. You know, you know, I'm holding on to the coattails of the Jay Hardcore the Rise podcast and just do going down the road behind him. Holding on. <laughs> yeah. The box story on. That's me. Now, remember, not a historian, a box story. And Thomas Hill will tell you the difference. He told me once, but it was a big paragraph. I got it written down, but I, I couldn't memorize all that, man. So you want to know the difference between a box story and a historian? Ask the mayor of YouTube, Thomas Hill. Okay, he'll tell you. All right. <laughs> but yeah, man, we got a big week for box. We're going to be mm, happiest boxing fans this week, man. Pro Box Week, got a top rank card on Friday. It's loaded with their young fighters, man. Emiliano Vargas, one of uh, Fernando Vargas' sons on the card. Raymond Miratala is on there, man. Richard Torres, what? I can't wait. And then Saturday, the big one, Tim Zhu and the Towering Inferno, Sebastian Fundora. Mm, mm, mm. Females Undisputed Fight. Then uh, I think Lara is on there. You know, he has uh, 
I think it's a WBA 160 title. So three title fights. And did I say Rolly and Pitbull? That might be the fight of the night, man. Rolly and Pitbull, that's the one I'm looking forward to. Because both of those guys are going to be right there. No backup in either one of them. Okay. It's going to be very interesting. Because Pitbull is very short, you know. And uh, I don't know uh, how effective uh, he's going to be trying to get inside on Rolly. Because Rolly's going to have a hellacious height and reach advantage. And, uh, you know. Me personally, I think Rolly's going to catch him coming in. I think Rolly's going to catch him with something and get him up out of there. That's just what I think. But I'll be at the Crow Show Sunday. So if I'm wrong, y'all can get me. <laughs> but I got Rolly. Yeah. Yeah. In that one. And uh, we're going to start in about five minutes. I got some uh, great switchers for you, man. And like I said, I use some active guys. I got Bud Crawford. Uh, of course, Marvelous one on there. With one of the, might be the greatest switch of all time. When I came down to the best switch of all time, I came down to two. Hagler and Bud, one of them two. Okay, yeah. A lot of times people think when you're talking best ever, they disregard the current era. But yeah, you can have the best ever in this era. Most definitely. And if Bud had a one up there and beat Canelo at 168, man. Hmm. You had to start thinking about him in terms of best ever, man. But it didn't happen. Don't think it's going to happen. Okay. But yeah. Switch hitters and power punches. But everybody okay this Tuesday afternoon? Working our way through another week. It's Tuesday. And the Eastern Assassin on Friday is a profile. We are going to have an enjoyable week for boxing fans. Yes. I know I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah. And like I said, the fight of the week, I'm thinking it's going to be Rolly and Pitbull. That's going to be a bond burner, fan friendly. You know, both come forward fighters. No backup in either one of them, man. But something going to have to give. <laughs> You know, and that's Saturday. We're in fight week. Wait no longer. Okay, a couple of days, and it's here. And then we got uh, we got some good fights. We got Ryan and Devin. Face of boxing fight. Next fight is scheduled. Uh, I don't know. Is Boost and Cody Crowley official on the Cinco de Mayo card? I, I don't know about that one. I know it's been talk of it, but I don't know if it's official yet. Okay, so we will say it's Jermaine Ortiz, which is, and, and so does uh, Jose Pedraza. Yeah, I didn't use too many guys in this era, just uh, the best ones, you know, Bud Boots. That's and Fury is a pretty good one, yeah. So, because it, I, I couldn't really think of one like four all the time, it's just not a lot of standouts, you know. So, the guys from this era just use the top, top of the line, you know. Like Bud Boots, Tyson Fury, yeah. A lot of people didn't know Tyson Fury switched it, but yeah, pretty good one too. Mm -hmm. So that's how I did it. So you'll see. We're going to start in a couple minutes. Let's start now, five minutes early. I'm running out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> Let's start all these switch hitters and power guys, okay? Switch hitters first. Okay, give a little speech first. You know how the box story does it. Now, while most boxers will take to the to the ring in one one set stance, you know, orthodox or southpaw, there are those rare fighters who utilize the technique of switching between both orthodox and southpaw. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a switch hitter anyway? What is a switch hitter? Now, like I just said, the majority of fighters tend to fight out of the orthodox stance, you know, leading with their left hand and left foot forward, right? Now, while this is the most commonly used stance, there are others who fight from the southpaw stance. Typically left-handed boxers, but not always. Now, all orthodox are right-handed, 
all southpaws are left-handed. Like the face of boxing, um, excuse me, the king of the casuals pointed out one to me, Friday, Zab Judah, pulled out of the southpaw, but he was really right-handed. I didn't know that. And the king of the casuals taught me that. Yeah. So-called king of the cat. Okay. But, you know, typically, you know, left-handers are for right-handed orthodox, not all the time. And the South Fork lead, you know, opposite from the uh, orthodox. Right hand, right foot forward, right? Yeah. Now, then there are those who can comfortably and smoothly interchange between the two stances. These are the ones known as the switch hitters who we're going to be talking about today. And there have been several high profile champions who truly mastered the art of switch hitting. And they use it to their advantage in the ring at the highest level. Now, how do you uh, achieve success as a switch hitter, right? Now, all of the fighters on this list have traits in common, okay, that allow the pitch effortlessly, possessing attentive footwork, versatility, and agility. So all these fighters on this list have those three things in common that allow them to do it very well. Attentive footwork, versatility, and agility, right? They have utilized their talents from both stances to great effect and been able to adapt within the ring ropes to achieve success. Now, there are ways of becoming a better switch hitter and develop the technique over time so it becomes second nature in sparring and in actual fights. You know, practicing and drilling the basic combinations from both stances is essential, right? Every day in the gym, Turning from both the dominant stance, whatever your dominant stance is, to the other will help improve skills for when it matters and build muscle memory. That's key, muscle memory. You know, just do it without even thinking about it, right? That's how the great ones do it, like Bud Crawford, Hagler. They had a muscle memory. That's one minute they orthodox, next minute they stop for without even thinking about it. Automatic, right? Now, playing to the stress will help with switching, too. For example, a fighter that possesses a strong right hand for their power shots can transfer this across the southpaw, you know, if you're orthodox, right? And develop a stinging jab from the other stand. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. Now, one of the key aspects of switch hitting switching stances is gaining an understanding of new angles and how to capitalize on them, right? Get used to the angles involved, leading with both the right and left hand in order to fully grasp the benefit of switch hitting and achieve superior positions in the ring. Okay, let's talk about some of these switch hitters now. Okay. First one is going to be uh, Robin Hagman. He's already on the screen. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, that is. Okay, I'm going to take this down some, this music. Because I listen to the playbacks. And I'll be blasting y'all out. Somebody should have put it in the chat. Like Bill Knuckles did. Bill Knuckles told me turn it down one time, right? And I turned it down. That's Bill Knuckles. He's back, by the way. I haven't seen him yet. He's welcome in my chat. Mm -hmm. The young brother knew that Bill Knuckles inside out. I wish he would have followed through. That would have been a good addition to the JBT, man. Yeah, because he knew that, that sport. But okay, Marvelous Marvin Hagler is first. Okay. Yeah, you're right, Ed. Mike Tyson did. Mike Rim is in the building. And I am now using the correct pronunciation of his name. <laughs> Salute, Mike Grimm. How are you today, bro? But you are 100% correct, Ed. I had forgot that. 
But Mike Tyson did uh, switch early on, right? You know, 100% correct. Yeah. He's on, I got him in here though, but he's on the power puncher side. <laughs> but marvelous Marvin Hagler, okay. Now, like I was saying earlier, perhaps the greatest switch hitter in boxing, I got it down to between him and Bud. Perhaps the greatest switch hitter in boxing history. Definitely one of the best middleweight champions ever. No doubt about that. Marvelous, right? Marvelous was a complete fighter. He was technically able to fight at the elite level from either stance, effortlessly. There's that word again, effortlessly. That's how Marvin did it. Now, despite, he was a right-handed fighter, but despite being right-handed, he was mainly trained out of the southpaw stance, right? And he had that sledgehammer jab, remember? Used his versatile skill set to become a dominant middleweight ruler. Ruled for seven years, 80 to 87. And he was a truly destructive operator. Had a Hall of Fame career, Marvin did. Yes, he did. Makes up his butt proper. These are just little very brief uh, descriptions. Because we got the power punches today, too. I think. Yeah, we should be able to. Next is old Bud Crawford. Active fighter. Still active. But like I was saying, to be considered all-time in any category in the sport, you don't have to be former. We got some active guys that can be in an all-time conversation. When we're talking all-time in different categories of boxing, yes, no doubt. Active guys can be talked about, especially the guy on the screen, Bud Crawford. Yeah, he's all time in a number of them right now. Definitely first ballot Hall of Famer. Two time undisputed in the four belt era. First man to do it, and second person overall. But the quote did it first. I think, yeah, the quote did it first, right? Bud was second. Mm -hmm. First man, though. Now, right now, what is he, 3D Vision? Three division world champion, former undisputed, lightweight, light welterweight, and welterweight. Okay, Bud Crawford, and he's become a genuine master of switch hitting. Master of it. He switches seamlessly, and Bud is a natural softball. Okay, natural left, left naturally left-handed. He has a unique style and ability to adapt to any opponent in front of him. And one of the most dangerous finishers in the sport today or at any time. And Bud is capable of ending a fight from Orthodox or Southpaw, Bud Crawford. Okay. Apparently the pound for pound king. Some people have the monster, and uh, you can can't be mad about that. But you know, I, I think it's still Bud Crawford for right now. Mm -hmm. Next, that's Nassim Hamed, yeah, former fighter. Now, uh, Nassim was very unorthodox, very unorthodox movements, and man, he had some. Ooh, Hellacious reflex. Unconventional in everything he did in there. In including the way he planted his feet in different stances. Constantly switching. He switched a lot more than anybody. Hmm, probably more than anybody. And um, he would leave his opponent unsettled with his sudden movements from Orthodox to Southpaw. Called himself Prince Naheem. Also could knock out an opponent with either hand. And uh, at the height, height of his powers, he was a, a featherweight king, Nassim Hamed. Another great switch hitter. 
Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury. Mm-hmm. One of the best heavyweights of the modern era. Got to give it to him. He's come become a hugely effective and versatile fighter. Now he can't be labeled as a specific type of fighter due to his unique, unique style. Constantly switching stances during the course of a fight. He, he keeps his opponents guessing. Smooth switch work, smooth footwork, footwork. Constant barrage of feints called the Gypsy King. He can easily switch from being a swarming fighter or a defensive mover, the Gypsy King. Going for undisputed, uh, I believe it's May against Ola and the Uzi. I heard it was a rematch clause either way. And I hope they don't end up one one and just leave it at that. But in this area of boxing, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, have two fights, each one wins one, and then just uh, say that's it. But no, man, one one. You got to have a trilogy. Willie Pep, going back to my era. One of my favorite eras, Willie Pep. Defensive genius. But I did that thing last week. He was involved in doing it, allegedly, doing the fight. So, yeah. Didn't like that, Willie. But he was a featherweight legend. Arguably the best featherweight of all time. Okay. Now, Salvador Sanchez's career hadn't been cut quarter at 23 years old. Uh, there might not even be a conversation about best featherweight okay Salvador Sanchez is still in the conversation and his career was cut short at 23 years old man so if he'd have went into his prime had the entire career hmm, ain't no telling how good he would have been but Willie Pep is a featherweight legend arguably the best featherweight of all time all time great now he can't be labeled as an out and out switch hitter but he possessed some of the best footwork in boxing history. And he used that to become a defensive genius. Now he did switch it. And he was rarely hit clean. He was sweepy and fluid way before sweepy and fluid. Really got hit clean. He was like a shadow in the ring. He may sometimes make his opponents look foolish with how good he was defensively. Had him swinging that air. The will of the wisp. And sometimes he used this witch hitting as a means of defense, okay, to get himself in a safe position. And he would throw a backhand directly from switching and use that to keep his opponents off balance. Willie Pep, the will of the wisp, will of the wisp. Next up, Andre Ward, that's no G. Andre Ward, yep, he was a switch hitter. Andre. He's another fighter that blended a mix of styles and worked rigorously on all aspects of his craft. Now, rather than switching to keep opponents on edge, Andre would utilize his switching abilities efficiently whenever he saw an opponent or needed a different approach mid-fight, okay? He developed excellent footwork. Hall of Fame career. And a key to his success was being able to keep his opponents at optimum range at all times. And use his jab alongside that. Okay. 
And of course, that's all of put you. Well, I have one more. Last but not least, it's Jerron Ennis. Okay. Like I said, it's not a whole bunch of standout switches. Like the ones of uh, Remo name, but I didn't want to use. I used to, I'm, this is boxing history, so I don't like talking about uh, the current era too much, right? But, you know, it wasn't a lot of switch hitters, standout switch hitters, so I had to use a couple guys. But just the major top ones, like Boots, like Bud, Tyson Fury. But Boots, there he is. Jerron Boots in it. Lonnie Lee, hashtag JBT in the building. What's up, Lonnie? How are you today? Welcome to another episode of Cat Sports, the box story. We're talking about um, switch hitters today. And uh, power punches. I was writing down Lonnie Lee's name. I wrote Cat Sports name. Uh, Lonnie Lee, hashtag JBT, salute. Another meeting at one o'clock Saturday too, by the way, Lonnie. You're welcome to it, Tim. Okay. Taking all ideas. Maybe you can fill one of those positions we have over. But Deron Ennis, with the debative and fluid style, coupled with a heart-pounding killer mindset. Yes. Ennis ignites the ring, sending shock waves of excitement through the hearts of fans worldwide. Now, not to mention, Boots already has 31 wins with 28 thunderous knockouts. Okay. Wow. I don't even have my calculator over here. Hmm, I'm in my other office today. I left my calculator behind. But that's a hell of a knockout for me. 28 and 31 wins. And he's yet to be beaten. Okay. Now, right now, the only thing holding him up with Boots back is his opponents. <laughs> right? Nobody won't fight him. You know, and he has yet to face a world-class fighter, in my opinion. And Boots has called out the number one fighter in his division. And he's patiently waiting for the fight that everyone knows he deserves. Right? Okay, let's move to the power guys. It's more of them. Okay. Bruce Gas Boxing Jazz and more in the building. Salute, bro. What's up, Bruce Gas? Okay. And I'll say this about Bruce Gas. That's another great history channel because guess what? That's where the box story then goes to get his history. Over there with Bruce Gas, right? <laughs> yeah. Bruce Gas Boxing Jazz and more in the building. Salute, Bruce Gas. How are you today? Good to have you aboard. We talked, well, we just finished talking about switch hitters. Now we're going to talk about the power guys. Power punches. You know, like uh, Big George, uh, Ernie Shavers, you know, Ali, uh, Norton, Frazier, Foreman, all those guys from the 70s were asked who, who hit them the hardest. Who The ones that fought him, and they all said Ernie Shavers. <laughs> Yeah. They all said Ernie Shavers. Yeah. And if I was doing like best of instead of just some top guys, Ernie Shavers would definitely be number one. No doubt. They say Ernie hit like a mule. I think of as Ernie uh when they were starting to make the Rocky movies, Sylvester Stallone had Ernie in for uh he was going to get a small part in the movie. He was going to play one of those roles. I forgot which one. And uh, him and Ernie were sparring. And Ernie was taking it easy on, on Sylvester. And Sylvester said, come on, Ernie. Show me something, man. And Ernie hit Sylvester Stallone in the body. Ernie didn't get that part. <laughs> yeah. He asked him to show him something. Ernie <laughs> said, you sure? Yeah. Sylvester said, no, I'm not even going to be acting, taking no punches from this guy. No way. Okay, bear with me for a minute. I'm trying to get my power punches uh, presentation together. 
but this is Cat Sports, the box story, and on a uh, Tuesday afternoon with my people. I'm coming. Everybody, all right? So this is a big week for boxing fans, man. We got Pro Box. We got uh, the Card Friday, headlined by uh, Oscar Valdez, and then we we got a female uh, undisputed fight on that card too, Sinisa Estrada. That's who she was fighting. And then we got the big one uh, Thursday. Remember, Tim Zoo, the towering inferno. Yeah. Mm hmm But I like uh Rolly and Pitbull in the fight of the whole week. Okay. Now let's uh let's uh talk about these power guys. Yeah, here we go. There's boots on the screen right there. Go ahead and put the first power guy up. There he is. The owner of Suzy Q. Rocky Marciano. There's Al Booker. I had to put Rocky on here or Al Booker somebody hurt me. <laughs> Al Booker said at least Friday Rocky is uh number one in power punch. I kind of agree with it too. Yeah. Oh Suzy Q. Man, it gotta be bad if he named his right hand, right? But what's up, Al Booker? Yeah, they sent Ernie home early. <laughs> yeah. The Rocky said, you did not get the part. He said, I'm not even gonna be acting, practicing, taking punches from you, man, no. But he told him, show him something, because Ernie was taking it easy on it. The best of Stallone said, told him to show him something. Ernie hit him in that side, and that was it. He said, no, nah, Ernie, see you later. You can leave now. <laughs> okay, now. Now, a list of some of the biggest power punches in boxing history has as much potential for being contentious as a powerful pound ranking, right? Now, knockout percentages, testimonies from past opponents, and highlight reels are all useful. But in the end, subjective opinion is still the deciding factor. Now, what is a power punch anyway? Okay, what is a power punch? I mean, what is punching power? What is punching power? Okay. Punching power is the amount of, of kinetic energy in a person's punches, right? Knockout power is a similar concept relating to the probability of any strike to the head to cause unconsciousness or a strike to the body that renders an opponent unable to continue fighting. Knockout power is related to the force delivered the timing, the technique, precision of the strike, among other factors, okay? Now, in order to increase the, the, the mass behind a punch, it is essential to move the body as a unit throughout the punch, right? Now, power is generated from the ground up, such that force from the ankles transfer to the knees, right? And then from the knees to the thigh, then from the core to the chest, and from the chest to the shoulders, from the shoulder to the forearms, and finally the component force through the fist into your opponent. So the most powerful punches are able to connect their uh, each portion. Though the most powerful punches are able to connect their entire body and channel the force from each portion of the body into a punch. Okay? Now, first is Rocky Marciano. That's the rock on the team. Owner of Suzy Q. That's what his right hand was named. And we got a good look at Suzy Q Friday, remember? And by the way, this Friday, the profile is the Eastern, Eastern assassin himself, Larry Holmes. Don't miss that one. Now, um, Rocky's primary strength might have been his inhuman stamina, okay? 
because Rocky had one thing that'll keep a fighter in, had two things, the two things that'll keep a fighter in any fight. Gas tank and chin, okay? If you got gas tank and chin, you always got a chance in any fight. You might be getting beat on the cards, but that gas tank and that chin gonna keep you in that fight, right? And uh, ex Jersey Joe, the 13th round, the Q came through. But Rocky's most uh, primary strength might have been his, his inhuman chin, stamina. Okay. Volume of hard punches and durability. But make no mistake, Rocky could crack. Okay. Like I was just talking about, his one punch destruction of Hall of Fame of Jersey Joe Walcott on September 23rd, 1952, which is arguably the greatest single shot in history. You saw it. That hook put Jersey Joe's lips, took him from under his nose and put him under his ear. Remember? Y'all saw it. People that was in here Friday, his lips was on the side of his face. Okay? I'm not exaggerating. Al Booker saw it. Wasn't there Al Booker? His lips was over on the side. Mm -hmm. Now Walcott, who also fought Joe Lewis with X, who punched harder between Rocky and Joe Lewis? He responded immediately. He said, Marcy Arnold was a one punch artist. He threw every punch like you threw a baseball as hard as he could. Now Rocky was small by today's standards. He generally fought between 184 and 189. He could probably made it down to light heavyweight in today's. You know, that ain't but what, 14 pounds? You could not, definitely a cruiserweight. He definitely would not be a heavyweight if he fought nowadays. But they didn't have cruiserweight back then. That was one of the reasons cruiserweight was formed. For smaller guys, they looked back at smaller guys like Rocky, Joe Frazier, and said when the next era, guys like that come along, they're not going to have to fight these big monsters like Tyson Fury and all those guys like that, man, yeah. But they didn't have it back then, so Rocky fought that heavyweight. It was a pretty good one. But don't get me wrong. He would be a good heavyweight in any era, too, okay? Wouldn't have really need it. He might have fought a heavyweight anyway. <laughs> if they would have had cruiserweight, okay? But he generally fought between 184 and 189, which would make him a, a, a small cruiserweight today. Not just a cruiserweight, a small cruiserweight, <laughs> okay? A small cruiserweight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the kinetic chain album. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so Rocky would not only be a cruiserweight nowadays, he would be a small cruiserweight, but the man fought that heavyweight back then. But he did fight in the era of the small heavyweight because I forgot the exact figure. Oh, yeah. Out of his 49 fights, only 10 people fought weight over 200. Okay. So, yeah. If there was a cruiserweight division back then, it probably would have been a cruiserweight. Most of the people he fought, yeah. But, um, like I was just saying, it wouldn't be a good idea to count Rocky out of any fight at cruiserweight or heavyweight in any era. The Rock, Rocky Marciano, one of my favorites, man, over the years. Next, Smoking Joe Frazier. Not Frazier, Frazier. Okay. Smoking Joe Frazier. Now, one knockdown that stands among the most memorable of all time, of course, you know, was the Frazier left hook that landed on the jaw of Muhammad Ali in the 15th round of the first fight, fight of the century. Ali sure remembers it. Now, he survived, but Frazier in that moment sealed his reputation as having one of the most Lethal punches in boxing history. Yeah, that Frazier left hook was something, man. Mm, mm, mm. Retired heavyweight Stan Ward, who sparred both Frazier and George Foreman, was asked, which of the two between Frazier and Foreman punch harder? No hesitation. He said Frazier. And then he said Frazier again. <laughs> yeah. Smoking Joe. He wasn't a mere puncher, though. He was a quick, Athletic, bobbing, weaving, whirling, 
dervish of a fighter. He was all that. And he made life hell for anybody he, they got in the ring with. Him. And he wasn't a big man. Frazier was five foot eleven and a half, and not much over two hundred pounds at his best. Okay. Yeah, he was in this era. Probably be a cruiserweight. Mm -hmm. Now, um, former heavyweight Joe Buckner said about Frazier, he was the most vicious and relentless fighter on the planet in those days. Okay, most vicious and relentless was Smoking Joe Frazier. Okay, let's move along here. What time we got? Oh, yeah, good time. It's just three o'clock because we got to get uh. Uh, we got we gonna get the preview at, preview at quarter to um four. What the marvels hashtag? Let's talk fashion. A blend of fashion, sports, entertainment, and life. Hashtag Let's talk fashion from Remo. Okay, but Nick's uh is Ron Law. Mm -hmm. There's Ron. There's Ronnie Ron Ron Law. Okay. Everybody okay? I hope y'all enjoying the show. The in shape heavyweights. That's right, eh? Yeah, I gotta pay attention to the chat. Yeah, and says the in shape heavyweights. <laughs> Our book would say heavyweight is the phantom efforts <laughs> these days. But good point, eh? The good shape, the in shape heavyweights, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Ron Law. Now, Ron Law was an exciting fighter, and he fought in the golden era of the heavyweight division in the 70s, right? I think that was probably the best era ever for heavyweights, man. I lived through that. I was young, but I lived through that. Okay. That's why I'm old now. <laughs> now, probably the best heavyweight of the past 50 years who never won a title. He never got a world title. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but he, he was a problem to the best heavyweights in that era, though. And um, like I was just saying, that era happened to be the best of all time. Now, in any other era, he probably would have had a title. But he just happened to fight, you know, in the golden era of heavyweights, right? All had three, four, five. Even Ali had five losses. I think he had five, yeah. Wasn't no O's back in them days, man, because any given night, anybody could beat anybody, right? Now, in May 1975, Muhammad Ali got a TKO, or TKO over Law in the level. But guess what? At the time of the TKO, Ron Law was leading Ali on all three cards. Mm -hmm. And the stoppage was viewed as controversial because we was getting close to round 15, man. And, uh, you know, Ali was the face. The greatest couldn't have him lose to Ron Law, so they stopped it. But Law was leading on all three cards. Well, that might have been 12. I don't know. Bruce Gass would know. If it was 12, it was definitely controversial. Because they did have some 12-round fights back then. They had 15 and 12. That was before they went to all 12. But it, it might have been. That would explain a lot about that stoppage. I'm going to have to check on that. But the fight he's most remembered for is his uh, 1976 war with George Foreman. Probably the most brutal and heavy, most uh, brutal and he exciting heavyweight fight in history. Lyle and George Foreman. That's a good one to watch. Ron Lyle, George Foreman, 1976. I have never watched that over. I've seen it before. But I'm going to correct that. Took the fight to Big George from the opening bell and rocked him with plenty of uh, body shot. He almost knocked Foreman out cold in the second round. Um, no, Foreman almost knocked Lyle out cold in the second round, but now Lyle managed to uh, recover. Now round four is probably one of the top 10 rounds in boxing history. Lyle dropped Foreman twice. But in between those two drops, the foreman dropped loud. 
Now, Foreman knocked him out in the fifth round, but um, it was a hell of a fight on the way to it, though. <laughs> on the way to that fifth round. Mm -mm -mm. Great fight. Next up is Jerry Cooney. Jerry Cooney. There he is. Jerry Cooney. Great heavyweight showdown with Larry Holmes in 1982. He um, he ended up losing the first fight of his career. Holmes got him in 13 TKO. And after that fight, he was never a major factor in the heavyweight division again. That was his shot right there. But coming into the fight, he had built the reputation as a ferocious puncher. His last two fights leading up to Holmes were both destructive one round stoppages of Ken Norton and Ron Lock. Got both of them in the first round. And he was 6'6. He would have fit right in nowadays, six foot six. He had one, another one of them left hook guys, crushing left hook. He had a great jab, great jab. Zapped his opponent's strength. And he was just using that to set up his bigger artillery. Okay, but he had a great dad, Jerry Cooney. But after the Holmes loss, uh, never really was the same. Okay, yeah. Took some big shots in that fight against Holmes. But it was a good fight, last 13 rounds. Yeah. Next up is Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber himself. Joe Lewis. Now, all these years after his retirement, many boxing historians still regard Joe Lewis as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some box historians do too. He held the belt for a record 12 years and 25 defenses. But like I was saying a while back, not just those 25 defenses. You got to look inside of them. Because I think um, 15 of them was inside of five. No, 23 of the 25 was stoppages. 15 of them was inside of five rounds. I think it was six of them was in the first round. So you got to really look inside of it. Not just the 25 defense. You got to look at what he did inside of them, man. Incredible. Just incredible. It had me like want to say, oh, no, Mohamed Ali, you're not the greatest, man. Joe Lewis. He was dominant in the decade of the 40s. He was a champion for the entire decade. Just like Ricardo Lopez was champion for the entire 90s in the uh, throwaway 105 division. Mm -hmm. And he was 51 over his career, but Ricardo Lopez had a draw. So I guess people look at that as a blemish. I don't know. I don't. 51 at all. Nobody never beat him. Yeah, 25 defenses is crazy, our book. And then 15 inside of five rounds, six in the first round, 23 by stoppage. Of those 25, only two people went the distance with him. That's dominant. Now, Lewis was small, too. He weighed around what cruiserweights weigh, weigh nowadays, yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of his more famous opponents that he beat were smaller, even smaller than him. But he still would have been a good heavyweight in this era. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the uh, fluidity and, the, and, and, and uh, his frame, fluidity of his motion was still translated into a punch. Very powerful punch. It was flat in most modern heavyweights. Okay, yeah. Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber. Yeah, he had an incredible run in the 40s, man. I don't think anybody will ever match that. Never say never, but wow. 25 title defenses, 23 of them stoppages. 
Mm-hmm. That's the record. And guess what? Guess who's second? Ricardo Lopez with 22 title defenses. The guy was just talking about. Yeah, right behind Joe Lewis. You don't hear too much about Ricardo Lopez because why? He was down there 105. They don't get the respect and credit they deserve, man. Them guys down there. Yeah. Bad man, Ricardo Lopez. I'm going to have to do a profile on him one day. He's retired. Yeah. Might be next Friday. Larry, Larry Holmes is this Friday, by the way. Next is Mike Tyson. Iron Mike Tyson, that is. Now, Mike Tyson's emergence as a dominant force at heavyweight in the second half of the 1980s is one of the most documented events in sports history, in boxing history, okay? He was kind of like the reincarnation of Jack Dempsey, how he was, the fame and stuff and attention he got back there in the 20s. But uh, Mike was like in a bigger form, bigger, badder form. Now, um, he would move in the range behind his peekaboo guard. Then he would attack, okay? Exploding in the action with concussive punches. Body and head, both hands. Now, once one common criticism of Mike is once you stood up to him, he'd fold. Because a lot of people say he won his fights before he even got in there, right? Come down there with just the towel and the, uh... He did have socks on, but it was little ankle socks that you couldn't see above his, above his boxing things. A lot of people said he didn't wear socks, but he did wear socks. But they were little ankle-like things that you couldn't see above his uh, shoes, boxing shoes, whatever they call them, yeah. But uh, yeah, intimidating, man. But it's one criticism that says once you stood up to him, he'd fold. But I don't agree with that. The, I think the thing is, if you could control the distance against him, you could take his punching power away from him, right? And, uh, you know, expose his, you know, he because he was short. You know, expose his height. That's what it was. It wasn't no thing about um, standing up to him. You had to control that distance against Mike. You know what I mean? Take away that punching power. Expose his height. You know? They know what I'm saying. Yeah. Evander Holyfield did this. Now, Evander mauled him at close range. And Lennox did, uh, uh, you know, Lennox was hitting him from the outside. Lennox Lewis. But those, they're the greatest heavyweight, two of the greatest heavyweights of all time, though, you know? Anybody couldn't do that, like Lennox Lewis and, 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 and Evander had the success they had against him, you know. Yeah, Walter, yeah, Walter did, Al Booker, yeah. Walter was up there. Yeah, they just wasn't good enough for Al Booker. Yeah, I don't agree with that. But that's one criticism they have, they say about it, but that's not true. But, you know, at his best against any heavyweight in history, Michael, Mike could get into exactly the range he wanted to. Yeah. And he could deliver hooks, uppercuts, overhands, in rapid speed. And he's one of the only fighters that clearly had other. He did have fighters intimidated now. Not many fight people, fighters could intimidate him like, like Mike would have. It was a big part of his game. Okay. But his talent had a lot to do with it too. It wasn't just the intimidation. Don't get it twisted. Talented guy. Vladimir Klitschko. Is on the list. A lot of Mel Klitschko. Why do they don't have a V in front of his name? Vladimir Klitschko. I always say Vladimir. Vladimir. Everybody okay? Ready for this big week? 
pro box stick around we got the uh hashtag let's talk fashion preview coming up at um coming up at um quarter to four Remo was in the building. Yeah. He wasn't here. Bear with me for one second, please. I got to uh, do something real quick. It won't be but a second. But stick around only. How's everybody doing now? Who y'all got? Roly or, or Pit? Oh, I got Roly. I got rolling. I think you're gonna catch him with something. Coming in, you know how Pitbull, Pitbull has just come forward. Okay. Ain't no side to side or none of that stuff. Just Pitbull is just coming. Come on, get off of the screen, man. There we go. Yeah. And Roly, it's gonna be a fan friendly fight though, I think. Yeah. Today is Tuesday, right? I mean, it's time going by so fast. I gotta ask, man. <laughs> I gotta ask. Cause man, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how this time is passing. Okay, Vladimir, Vladimir Klitschko is next. Now, Now, tough back chin, okay, by heavyweight standards. But otherwise, in a spectacular career, Klitschko has been stopped by such mortals as uh, Ross Purity, Lamont Brewster, and Corey Sanders. Never heard of none of them. That was just one of his his, his his big flaws, right? But he was called Dr. Steelhammer, okay? And he was a star pupil of Emmanuel Stewart. Legendary trainer. Same one who developed Tommy Hearns. Okay. Okay. Even when he was in the middle of exchanges, though his punching form was uh, it was good enough. Jab was punishing, punishing jab when he wanted it to be, and he excelled at turning the jab at the last second, turn it into a, a like a hook. Right, kind of like a sweeping hook. Remember, he used to do that. Turn the jab over last second. Turn it into like a sweeping hook. Right cross was just a perfect punch. One of the most perfect punches in boxing history. Nothing is perfect, but that Klitschko right cross was close to it. And the thing about it was his opponents could see it coming all the way in and it was still drop. Still would drop. Vladimir Klitschko. Next up. No, that's not George Foreman. <laughs> that's David Tua. Look like Foreman, don't it? Al Brooker said he's got Roley too. He said he think Roley has the power and awkwardness to catch him. I think so, Al Brooker. I agree. Pitbull doesn't have a uh, feet or power to deal with Roley. He's probably a better boxer though. Who Pitbull? Yeah. But I know it's going to be fan friendly between those two guys, man, because they are both two come forward guys. No backup in neither one of them. And something's gonna have to give. I don't think it's going to distance. And then watch it go to distance. <laughs> but you know, I think it's going somebody getting stopped in that one. I just think I just see Roly catching him with something coming in. I just do. 
And that might not be what happens, but that's the way I see it. Now, David Tua never won a world title. He was Samoan from New Zealand. But he put uh, multiple world champions to sleep. Just wasn't, didn't have a title at the time. <laughs> right. Had a great chin. Known for his chin. But he never had to develop the ability uh, to cut the ring off when he was in it with the world-class fighters. Probably would have been in the Hall of Fame if he knew how to cut the ring off. He still was one of the most popular fighters of the past 20 years, David Tua. I know y'all remember him. Stop John Ruiz and Michael Morris, both of them in the first round. Also stopped Haseem Rock, 10th round TKO. Mm -hmm. and he was trailing badly on the cards when he did that. Now, um, he lost a decision to Ike. I don't know his last name. I-B-A-B-U-C-H, -A -A but it set a record for punches thrown in a heavyweight fight. That fight did, okay. Yeah. I just learned that earlier. See, I'm learning doing these things too. Okay. I B E A B U C H I. Oh, not N guess B. This fight against this guy right here set a record for punches thrown in a world heavyweight fight. Y'all pronounced that. Y'all know damn well. Cast Sports can't pronounce that. Okay. <laughs> And it just contributed to a more rapid decline in Ike's mental condition. That fight right there was. He took so many punches. Now, Tua does not appear to have suffered any long-term effects from that fight. Okay. David Tua. Sonny Liston is next. See, I'll tell you this time is crazy, man. It was just five after three now is 318 and only two minutes went past five to 18 is 13 minutes but only two minutes went past i told you they done speeded the earth up but they're not going to tell us sunny listen now the 1960s were supposed to be the sunny listen era but this brass young upstart from louisville kentucky what was his name y'all came in and upset list. I believe his name was Cassius Clay. He was supposed to be one more speed bump in the highway to list. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what everybody thought heading into that fight, you know. Liston was gonna destroy this little young big mouth boy. But it didn't happen that way. And the reason that everybody thought he was going to destroy Ali was because at that time, Liston was the, the most devastating puncher boxing he had ever seen, right? Going into that time. Now, he was only like six feet and a half, but he had an 84 inch reach, the reach of like a seven footer would have. 84 inches. Wow. had oversized limbs, and he wielded them like an angry bear. Okay, had arms like telephone poles. And when he came into the fight with Ali, he had stopped 11 of his last 12 opponents. And coming off a concussive knock, first round knockout of Floyd Patterson.
1970, just six months before his death, he stopped crime. He was well, he was years past his prime, but he stopped um, Chuck Webner. And Chuck Webner, nobody stopped Chuck Webner. He was super durable. Bruce Gass can tell you that, right? But way past his prime, Sonny Liston stopped him. They say the power is the last shot thing that goes and stopped him with a body shot in the fifth round before they stopped the fight on cuts in the ninth round. Yeah, Sonny. Sonny Liston, we're coming winding down, like three more to go. Next up is Lennox, I think. It is Lennox. Lennox Lewis. Justin James, salute. Well, Justin James has been in here. Yeah, Sonny was a bad man, Justin. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Next is Lennox, Lennox Lewis. Now, Lennox's legacy suffers a little bit because um, he was stunningly knocked out by two relative mediocre opponents, right? Oliver McCall and a Sim Rock, right? But unlike, like, Klitschko had kind of the same kind of knock on him, but unlike Klitschko, Lewis came back, okay? And, uh, and you know, he came back to avenge himself against both of those guys. He stopped, came back and stopped both of them, Rockman and McCall, and we met to stop them both in the fifth round. And uh, the other difference between Lewis and Klitschko, Klitschko used to kind of get like overcautious in letting his hands go. Lennox never did that, okay? And Lennox always remained committed to ending fights early. 6'5". Lennox also had an 84 inch reach, but unlike Liston, Liston was only six feet with the 84 inch reach. Lennox was a little tall. Lennox was 6'5". With the 84 inch reach, but still, that's the reach of somebody seven feet tall, 84 inches. And one thing about Lennox, he could beat you up from a distance with that long reach. Yeah, he excelled at that. Okay. Boxing behind his jab. But he was also capable of being a brawler. Don't get it twisted. Lennox could brawl too now. Okay. He could come inside and mix it up. Yes, he could. And he stopped brutally put score in six rounds on cuts. But the list of fights that never happened, I talked about this before too, the fights we didn't get. Remember, Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe. And they had the history, remember? The Olympics. And then when they first turned pro, they both were very successful. Seemed like they was on a collision course, but it never happened. Bowe's camp made that ridiculous offer. Remember when they was uh, negotiating the fight between Lewis and Bowe? Bowe was gonna propose a 90 to 10 split. Why would Lennox Lewis take a 90 to 10 split? I beat you in the Olympics, man. Anything, I should be the A-side. That's just saying I don't want to fight you. Like Canelo, 200 million, uh, asking for that against Benavidez. Both 90 to 10 split is the same thing. That's just saying I don't want to fight you, right? What reason on earth would Lennox Lewis take a 90 to 10 split against this man? Okay. And at that time, they were supposed to fight. Bo was fresh off beating Evander Holyfield two times. But remember, he tossed that WBC belt in the trash can. Remember that? Rather than fight Lewis. And Lewis was coming off a two round destruction, a razor relic at that time. That would have been a good fight. Probably a good series of fights between them two. They was both young, successful heavyweights at that time, man. But Bo didn't want it. Next up is Big Joe, Big George, Big George, Big George Foreman, okay. And it's not difficult to imagine 
George Foreman being called the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Remember, he had two careers when we came back. Remember, that's the old George. I got the new George too, see? Yeah. George had two careers. Reinvented himself and came back and won the title. He was um the oldest, he's still the oldest man to win the heavyweight title, but he used to be the oldest man to win the title, period. But B Hop passed him on that one. Yeah. So he's the oldest to win, still the oldest to win the heavyweight title, though. Now, if he could have remained mentally strong enough to regroup and keep winning fights. They would have forced Ali to give him a rematch. But Foreman ended up retiring, remember. Probably would have beat Ali the second time because he wouldn't have fell for that rope dope nonsense. Yeah. I don't know, though, because Ali had something for everybody, so I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. Just do boxing. The voice is in the building. Coming up in about one half hour. Okay. Salute to Just Do Boxing, the voice. We talked about switch hitters earlier. Now we're winding down talking about the power hitters. But salute to Just Do Boxing, the voice. Coming up in 30 minutes or so. Okay. We're going to get that Remo uh, hashtag Let's Talk Fashion people in about uh, 15 minutes or so. Finishing this up. Yeah. No, I'm not going to say former Paul would have beat Ali the second time because. All he has for everybody, except for Holmes, because Holmes and Norton, I think Norton beat him three times, but he was way past it. He shouldn't even have been in there with, with uh, Holmes. He had been in the hospital months before that fight. And say like he owed Don King some back money and Don King forced him to fight. Yeah, Don King was a real sleazeball, man. And, uh, you know, they talk about getting the mafia out of Boston, but they still had got Don King, the Bob Falls, Mauricio, who needs the Mafia when we got them guys? Paula was better off when the Mafia was running them. If you ask me, they still fixing fights. Maxi Hughes, George Campbell. Think that wasn't fixed? Come on, man. Yeah. But yeah, if former had had himself together mentally, he probably wouldn't have missed the 80s. Because I think it was almost like the 90s when he came back. He probably would have fought all through the 80s. Just think it, you know, this George and that George wouldn't have had that gap in there. Just straight through fighting. Imagine how mm, the legacy of George Foreman, if he just kept straight through fighting, wouldn't have had that retirement and had to come back. Mm, I just can't imagine that. Foreman would have been, mm, probably be talking about him as the greatest heavyweight of all time. Still legendary, having the gap in there. Just think if he wouldn't have had it. Right? That's something to think about. I never thought about that before. Yeah. But we had a little uh, bridge between, little gap between that one and that one. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, he had a brutal right hand. Aside, aside from Ali and Jimmy Young, he crushed the best fighters from the golden era, okay? Stunned everybody when he smashed Joe Frazier in 1973 in two rounds. Knocked him down six times in two rounds, okay? And then they fought again in 1976. Frazier didn't do much better. This time, he knocked him down in the fifth round. He didn't go down six times this time, <laughs> but he still got stopped in the sixth round. And he stopped Ken Norton in two rounds. But probably the most amazing of his knockouts was when he was 44 years old, when he got that championship as the oldest man, when he knocked uh, out Michael Moore. Okay, 1994. Former was trailing hopelessly on the cards, right? But he caught uh, Michael Moore in round 10 and got him up out of there. Yeah. Really looked like he really extended any energy when he turned that punch over and sent more to the canvas. 
And that proved that the power is the last thing to go. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. That was when he became the oldest man to win the championship. I thought he was 47, but 44. Yeah. 44, 47. Still ain't got no business still in the ring, but he was in there and he became champion. And number one is Ernest Shavers. Not that. Now, if I was doing the best power list, he would be, this would be number one right here. Ernest Shavers, no doubt. Yeah, two different guys, um, Justin. Exactly. I'm just saying, suppose it wouldn't have been that gap in there. Suppose he would have just went from the first one all the way through the 80s, right up into the second one. Just imagine his legacy. Still legendary Hall of Fame, but just imagine if he would have never stopped, man. Mm. I mean, Mike Tyson would have had to get in there, you know? He did fight Holyfield, but he never fought Tyson. He would have had to fight Tyson and all those great heavyweights of the 80s. Yeah. So, wow. That George Foreman against Mike Tyson? My God. I'm a, this George Foreman right here against Mike Tyson? woo -hoo. We now that's a dream fight right there. Mm, mm, mm. But Ernie Chambers is, is the last one. Okay, and we like we got yeah, we got plenty of time. Now by the early 80s, Ernie Shavers' punching power was so legendary that he was able to parlay it into a part-time gig in professional wrestling serving as a guest referee and ringside enforcer. I told you they asked a lot of the heavyweights from the 70s who had, who punched in the heart and all of them without hesitation said Ernie Shavers. Ernie Shavers. And he fought around the same time George Foreman, big punches like that, man. Yeah, but it was Shavers. 74 wins, 68 by knockout. But check this out. Of those 68 knockouts, 33 of them came in the first two rounds. 33 in the first two rounds. And his mystique is enhanced even more for having competed in the golden era, you know, the 70s. Golden era of the heavyweights, right? Now, never reached championship status. He had some flaws. Okay, but his power still made him a threat to nearly everybody who got in the ring with him. Both Muhammad Ali and Ron Lau have repeatedly credited Shavers as the hardest puncher they ever faced. So they're not the only ones. Even a hit of Foreman, okay, excuse me, said he even punched harder than um, Foreman. That would have been crazy, wouldn't it, Justin? That would have been a crazy career, man that George Foreman would have just continued straight through. Mm, mm, mm. And like many heavyweights, like many hard hitting punch, like many, slow down cast, like many hard punching heavyweights from the past, Shavers retains a definite cult of appeal among fans to this day, okay? That's okay. That's that. There you have it. The uh, um, what's the title of this thing? Which hitters and power punch? <laughs> it's right in front of you guys. Everybody, smash it on the like button for me, please. For old cast sports. Al Booger says, I think Tyson would have taken out both young George and old George. You definitely would have got old George. George was a legend, though, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, would have been a good fight though. We're gonna get Remo up in here in a couple of minutes. Yeah, hope y'all enjoyed the show. Tomorrow is uh, oh Pro Box. I'm gonna do a little preview on who's fighting on Pro Box tomorrow night, and then I'm gonna start in the uh, 1900. I'm gonna do 1900 all the way to 1920 first. Uh, uh, then I'm gonna do decade by decade after that. But it's just gonna be um uh. A history of that period in boxing, some of the uh, fighters, the big fighters that fought in that period, and uh, some of the big fights that occurred in that period, and some um, significant events 
that occurred during those years. And then day by day, I'm going to, decade by decade, I'm going to come on up and talk about each decade, you know. But we're going to have a break from that Friday when we talk about the Eastern assassin, Larry Holmes. Okay. He's the profile this week. And stick around. I'm going to put the link in now for that. Uh, and not just for anybody that wants to come up and come up. You're just going to get a profile on uh, a half a second talk fashion. But this link is for anybody. Not just Remo, okay? Anybody, all are welcome, okay? But I do want Remo to come give us that. Uh, well, we'll never talk to him again if you don't, but he'll be up. <laughs> Just messing with you, Remo. Let me get all this mess off the screen. Yeah. Then I'm gonna put the link in. I'm good at the link now, okay? Wait a minute, come on. Um, Ernie, table we flew with you. Get out of the way. Be gone. There you go. Okay. Now, here comes the link. But how's everybody today? I'm doing great. I'm looking for, I look forward to this 2 o'clock every day, man. talking to uh, my people talking about boxing history and anything else man I can't wait till this weekend I think Roley and Pitbull are going to steal the show though but that card got three championship fights and that one Friday is a good card too man top rank any top rank card you're going to see a lot of young youngsters we got uh of course, Oscar Brown dad, that ain't no youngster, but he's headlined it. And then the female, um, uh, the female undis undisputed fight at, uh, 105, what is that? Draw weight, um, Denise Estrada, good female fighter. And then we got, uh, Raymond Murray Tyler on there. We got, um, one of the Vargas sons, one of uh, Fernando Vargas' sons, I think it's Emilio, Emiliano. Uh, Richard Torres, up and coming young heavyweight on there. Just a great card Friday, man. And then Saturday is a biggie. Um, you know, Tim Zhu and uh, Towering Inferno. I wish it was still Keith, man. We'd be in fight week for that. Could imagine all the shit Keith would be talking, but it didn't happen. Didn't happen. But the tower in front of is an adequate replacement, I think. He's hungry. He's coming off of that loss, you know? So yeah. Okay, there's the link. He's coming off of that loss. So yeah. Very adequate replacement, I think. The tower in front of. Yeah. So and then don't forget, like I said, Pro Box tomorrow. I'm gonna to give a preview of it like I always do. A lot of people don't talk about pro box and stuff. I do on here, man. Because it's boxing. It's good boxing. You know? It really is. Pro box is. I done seen Bo Mac on there twice now. He was uh, Keyshawn's brother. He don't impress me all that much. Keyshawn's brother. Here's the link. I, 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 I hope it's right. I did what I was supposed to do. Just boxing talk. That's all it is now, brother. And remember, we have the next meeting is Saturday at one o'clock. All are welcome. We need ideas. We we going places, man. Don't wait until we get up there in the stars and then want to jump on board, man. Get on board while we still in, we are, well, we're a little ways down the tracks, but you can run down there and still jump on the train. It ain't too far away from the station yet. But uh, we're gonna be way out there soon. We got uh, hardcore boxing news. First in the morning, then we got Cat Sports at two. Hardcore boxing news at eight, Cat Sports at two. Just do boxing and boards at four. I'm gonna lead you right into him. J Hardcore spins the block at eight. The closer closes down at nine. Every night, the Rise Podcast. Then we got uh, Remo. We got a weekly fashion show. 
Some's on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. That's tomorrow morning. And you catch a casual's corner at any time, Aunt McQueen. You got to turn your uh, notifications on for casual's corner. And, you know, wait for your notification. You know? Because I can't say this enough. You haven't watched the fight until you watch one after watching the casual's corner. You'll see all kinds of stuff. You'll see why they're doing certain things in there, right? You can see why they're clinching at certain times. Yeah. But you got to check out Casual Corner to know all that, man. You know? I've been watching boxing 40 years, and then after I watched that Casual Corner and watched that fight, man, I was like, damn, yeah, I see why he threw that left at that moment, and I see why he stepped over that way. Yeah. And now I see why he kept his distance that time. Mm hmm. That was after watching Casual Corner, so check it out. And that's part of the JVT, man. Yeah. Just boxing talk. That's all. Get on board. Or be left behind. <laughs> Justin James was in there, sir. Are you talking about that meeting, Justin? It was a great meeting. Yeah. Justin James, hashtag JVT, was in there, sir. Mm -hmm. Keyshawn's brother. I don't think I saw that one. That was the last pro box, but I think... I missed that one. I watched it, but I didn't see that one. I didn't see that one, Justin. I might have to. I guess you can pull that pro box back up and rewatch that. Yeah. But I'm just saying, pro box, we had some good fights on there, man. People sleeping on it. I was sleeping on it. Aunt McQueen and Thomas Hill put me down with it last year sometime. And I've been on it ever since. I, pro I, I preview it every Wednesday. And then Thursday, I talk about the fights that happened on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, is the link working? I guess it is. Anybody said it wasn't. Yeah, man. But uh, and don't miss tomorrow. We're going to start talking about a history of the decade. Yeah, it's going to be fun. That's what this is. I'm the box story. I talk about boxing history. Okay. And appreciate everybody that rocks with me every day. Okay. I didn't take nobody's wrench by accident today, did I? <laughs> yeah. But that's what it is, uh, work with just boxing talk. I like that T-A-W-K, yeah. That's cool. 343. And yeah, uh, Tim Zoo's manager was saying if they win, they're going to get on right into those bud negotiations immediately. So if Tim Zoo wins, that's that's coming, man. I would rather see Tim Zoo in bud than Fandora in bud anyway. You know? But hey, if Fandora wins, he gets the shot. And Boots, go on up to 154, man. I know uh, Red Man was saying stay there and wait for Devin and um, Tio. But if they come to 147, they're not going to fight him no way, man. What's up, Remo? What's going on, man? How you feeling? Not too much. I'm doing okay today. How about yourself? I'm all right, man. I'm all right. I decided to got... hop in real quick. We got a doctor's appointment. Well, let me give you this okay. little spiel I got for you. Oh, yeah. Give me that then. Yeah, yeah. Handle your business. Yeah. So we got to hear that preview. You know? So let me, let, me get, let me jump right into it, man. This okay. one here is a little, oh, it's this yours. One here is a little bit more, more interesting. We're talking about uh, cultural aspects and religion, and how that's deemed as you know, uh, sometimes looked at traditionally as you know appeasing to some, and then sometimes is shunned. Where people like Ali and Chris Jackson, also known as Mahmoud Abdul Raoul, that they. Their careers mm -hmm. took a little hit when they announced that you know they were part of the Muslim faith, versus yeah. you know tribe, uh, prideful, tribal uh, Mexicans and stuff like that. So we did a little comparison to you know mm -hmm. the directions of tradition in sports and entertainment, and uh, we also did sit down with a, a Caribbean comedian mm. where, we, where we discussed uh, you know. His involvement in, in the culture and you know things that the, around the nature of fashion that you know might be looked mm -hmm. at and how it's presented versus uh you know the American culture. It was yeah. just a good conversation, man. Sounds good. So you, I got another goodie for y'all. Fifty minutes, we pumping them out, man. Our, our show's only it seems like now. 
Yeah, sound like another good one though. Yeah, we having fun with these ones, man. Definitely appreciate y'all, man. Yeah, we appreciate you. Listen, yeah, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get my producer to put something special on the intro for you guys again. He, he liked the attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just make appreciate make you sure joining us, being make, a part of this JBT, man. Yeah. That's a that's a fact. Make sure y'all be in the building early, man. Meet me there. Don't meet me there. Beat me there. That's it. Yeah. Oh, I'll be there. Early. It's ten a.m. Start right. Ten a.m. Start. I give you a little grace okay. to come in. If if everybody got to use the bathroom and get some coffee, right? And, you know, fool around with, <laughs> yeah. with, with, with hardcore. You know, you get a shot. right after the hangout. You got to take a little quick break and then jump right back into the yeah, hashtag. I Let's talk. You. I got give you. Give everybody a little. Yeah, I don't want to hold you up in your appointment. Oh, go ahead, Reba. Yeah, for sure. I said, no, I just give a little five minute grace for everybody to go handle their business and then boom, right. the show begins. Right. Show begins. Okay. Yeah. That's the hashtag Let's Talk Fashion tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. from Remo. Yes, hashtag JBT, everybody. Yep. I'm back in this chat, though. I'm going to hear you. I'm listening. Okay, Remo. Appreciate you. All right. No problem. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. So, everybody, be there tomorrow, 10 a.m., right after the hangout. We just go from the hangout to hashtag let's talk fashion. Okay. And then cast sports again. And just do and the rise. That's how we do it during the week in the JBT. And hopefully we're going to be adding some more channels to this thing. So we can fill all these gaps in it just all day long. It'd be the JBT, you know. Because it's, you know, JBT, you get peace. You don't get any arguing. And uh you know that kind of stuff man we just talk boxing we got a fashion show we are a versatile organization man. yeah okay and that's good versatility is good always good right we got j hardcore in the morning bringing you all things boxing and everything else what you having for breakfast dinner lunch you get all that in the hangout you don't know what you might get in the hangout then Cass Sports gonna bring you that boxing history. Then of course, just do the voice. He gonna bring you that balance, man. He gonna bring you the boxing talk. He done had the great Shakur Stevenson on there. I think he got another interview with him coming part two. I hope I didn't miss it. And he gonna bring you that balance, man. In boxing, keep everybody on the even keel. And then we stay hardcore spins the block. Comes back with his show at eight. And then the Rise Podcast come on. And you know, on the Rise Podcast, you might see not one of the face of boxing's coaches. You might see both of them in there. Yeah, Calvin Ford, Kitty Ellis, both might be in there talking, man, on the Rise Podcast. Where else? There are regulars on that show. And that's 9 p.m. Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. on Sundays. And they are part of the JBT. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. They in the JBT, man. I'm telling you about that JBT. But they close the night down. Turn the lights off, close the door on the JBT day. Then we start it all up the next day. And the hangout, we have a, what we call a Friday night hangout at eight. You really don't know what you might find in there. Now I'm not trying to alarm you. You got robbed one time by being boxing news. We don't know how nobody got hurt or anything. You know, <laughs> came in there with his mask on and everything. We're like, what's up with that? But yeah, it's all fun, yeah. Friday night hangout is a special hangout with J Hardcore every Friday. So don't miss that. Yeah, but that's the, how the JBT does it. And you got another cast sports winding down. You got the voice in 10 minutes. Just do the boxing coming on today. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow at 2. So Justin says, good bud and bud and boxing. <laughs> and everything in between us, right, Justin? You hit it on the nose. Yeah, me too. I always watch it a couple times. Let's say let's talk crashing a couple times because we only get once a week. So I watch it over. <laughs> but tomorrow we get an, an original one. It's Wednesday again already. I tell you, man. It seems like it's like two or three times a week, though. Really? That Wednesday coming around so fast. It's amazing. Then like I got do two or three shows a day. It, it comes around so fast, you know? Wow. But I ain't mad because I enjoy this. Interacting with other boxing fans. We didn't have this back 
when I was a young man, you know. All we had was boxing and uh you had to wait until the actual fights came on. You didn't have boxing 24-7 every day, you know. You had to wait till the shows came on to get the stories and the news and stuff. We did not have all this. This is amazing. But I ain't mad at it. It's great. And like I'm saying, this week, this is a big boxing week here. Pro Box tomorrow. We got uh, Oscar Valdez. Card, big top rank card Friday. And you know, when you get a top rank card, you're going to see plenty of young fighters on there. Because the ball father got them, right? And then uh, we got a uh, women's undisputed card. Ten rounds, two minutes. Jake giving up 12 rounds. Because I told you, Jake had a, his last card, he had a uh, women's um, prospect fight for four rounds. But guess what? It was three minutes. It was four three-minute rounds. Okay. But the WBC belt just won't be involved over there with Jake because, you know, Mauricio won't sanction three minutes for women. I don't know why. But uh, the other three are on board. WBA, IBF, WBO. Yeah, they're on board with it. That's why Amanda Serrano dropped her WBC belt. So if the women want to go over there and get those 12 three-minute rounds, they got to drop that WBC belt because Mauricio, I don't know what's wrong with that man. What is the difference? What, what, is, I, what is the reason anyway to, 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 to not give the women the 12 rounds three minutes? What is the reason? I don't understand. Is it injury? You can get injured just as quick in 10 rounds or two minutes as you can in 12 or three. They're getting in the ring, right? So I don't get it. But I one day maybe uh maybe it'll all be three minutes across the board, you know. Maybe. But uh it's good that progress has been made, you know. I mean Serrano says she's not doing any more championship fights at ten rounds, two minutes, and she hasn't. She had a second one scheduled a few weeks ago, remember, but they um she got injured, but they still had to call it. And Jake impressed me. He gave everybody a 100% refund. He didn't have to. Imagine a ball father. A ball father would have said, you still got the fight. You're not getting your effing set back for me. <laughs> you know how he talks. He wouldn't have. He still gave, he still had the card. So he's not giving out no refunds. You know, but Jake did it. He gave 100% refund to everybody, to everyone that bought tickets. You know, the youngster, they like their youngster more and more every day, you know. A lot of people say he's bad for boxing. I, I don't, I disagree, you know? And when he started fighting and all that, he just filling the void that these current active fighters, fighters are not filling. They, they running around tiptoeing, scared of each other's shadow. So Jake and the YouTubers just stepped in there and started fighting. If we get in the big fights, we want it from these real boxers, then we wouldn't be worried about YouTubers fighting and, and, and carrying on, but. The real boxers are so worried about O's and stuff, you know? Somebody come close to beating them, you're not getting a rematch. You came too close to taking that O. It's crazy. The state of boxing. But that, but we still love it, you know? It's our sport, we love it, we're gonna still support it. So, what can you say? But guess what? We can still complain about it, damn it. <laughs> right? We can still complain. <laughs> So, yeah. But I'm getting ready to put another cast sports in the books. I will appreciate everybody. 1,000%, man. And just everyone, please hit the like button for me. We got divorced in five minutes. Just do boxing. Member of the JBT, okay? And don't forget, we're having another meeting uh, Thursday at 1 p.m., okay? We hope everybody, we get more attendance because we still got the positions to fill. And it came up in a meeting that... Uh, Maybe those positions will be filled from somebody that wasn't even in last Saturday's meeting. Me, I'm part of the uh, recruitment team. <laughs> Me and Jay Hardcore. Of course, Remo and Ant handle all that technological, uh, analytical type stuff, yeah. That's right up there, alleys. So we got that covered. We got the best two I can think of doing that, man. Yes. So we're going to be good. Just do boxing. Al Booker. Bruce Gass, Boxing Jazz, and more. Lonnie Lee, hashtag JBT. Mike Grimm, Attentive Ant McQueen. Remo, hashtag Let's Talk Fashion, hashtag JBT. 
J Hardcore, hashtag JBT, the founder of the JBT, J Hardcore. What an idea he came up with there, man. Salute to J Hardcore. Mike Masick, Showtime the Guy Pass, our friend from St. Louis, Missouri was in here. Justin James, hashtag JBT. Big time JBT member and supporter. Was Justin was in the meeting, sir? I did tell you about it. And Miss Cass, hashtag JBT. Salute to Miss Cass because she's the brains behind this cast sport outfit. I'm the brawn. I do the leg work. Miss Cass does the thinking. Okay. Couldn't do this without her, man. Appreciate you, Miss Cass. All right. And I appreciate everybody, man, for rocking with me and supporting my growing channel. Just do boxing is coming up next in like five minutes. I told you I'm gonna leave to take you right up to him, didn't I? But I appreciate everybody. But like I always say, you can't get away from me that easy. You're gonna see me somewhere today. Just do J Hardcore, the rise. So I'll talk to y'all later. But everybody still have a great day. This is Cash Sports. See y'all later.